All right, I, um, I think we can go ahead and get started. I have some introductory business to take care of and remarks to make. So that will give other people who are joining a chance to, to, get, to get into the digital space with us before um, the conversation starts. So I want to say welcome to everyone. My name is Leslie gross Wurtson, and I'm a postdoc here at the Council on African Studies at Yale University. Um, I'm really pleased to be convening this conversation today with Nanjola Nyabola. Um, I'm a geographer by training, so even though we are gathered here in this digital space, I want to locate myself here in New Haven, Connecticut, which is on land traditionally stewarded by the Pequot and Quinnipiac and other Algonquin speaking peoples. I also um, need to do some recognition of people today. Um, Michael Capello, the um, head of the Council of African Studies, Kristen Siebert and Nora Langett, who are um, respectively the program director for the Councils of African Studies and Middle East Studies and um, program coordinator for African Studies, have done a lot um, on the back end to make this happen and are going to be helping out um, again on the back end with fielding questions and keeping me on task for the most part. Um, so they're in the building here somewhere, although we don't get to see each other uh, and um, we'll be avidly following this discussion. So before I introduce Nanjala, I want to let you, um, the audience, know how you can be involved in our conversation today. Um, my plan is that for the first part of the hour um, of this conversation, I have some questions that I want to talk to Nanjala about, particularly concerning her book and some of her other research as well. During this conversation, feel free to ask questions. You can write them in in the Q&A box that is in the bottom of your screen. And Kristen and Nora will be helping us keep track of those. Um, I'll try to kind of keep one eye on those questions as we're having this first part of the conversation. But I've also dedicated the last half of the hour to taking your questions and bringing you, you know, directly into this conversation so that you can um, kind of weigh in and ask Nanjala what you want to ask her or offer your insights or comments as well. Um, I really appreciate that about this digital space that we can invite people from all over the world and I'm really looking forward to a robust and generative conversation. So let me introduce our guest today. Nanjala Nayabola is a writer, independent researcher, and political analyst who is currently located right now in Nairobi. Is that right, Nanjala? Okay. Um, her work focus- That is correct. <laughs> okay, I, I didn't think you were traveling around at the moment, but I had to double check. <laughs> her work focuses on conflict and post-conflict transitions with a focus on refu refugees and migrants, which is something really near and dear to my heart, as well as East African politics generally. Her work has um, appeared in numerous publications, including Foreign Policy, Foreign Affairs, El Zira, World Politics Review, and many chapters and edited volumes. She's the author of Digital Democracy, Analog Politics, How the Internet Era is Transforming Kenya, and the co-editor of Where Women Are, Gender and the 2017 Kenyan Elections. She also recently co-edited a series in African Arguments entitled Traveling While African, which I hope we have a little bit of time to talk about to you today. Nanjala holds a BA in African Studies and Political Science from the University of Birmingham and an MSc in Forced Migration and African Studies, both from the University of Oxford. Um, she also, where she, I'm sorry, where she was a Rhodes Scholar. And she also has a JD from a certain law school that will not be named um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So, <laughs> thank you for being here today, Angela. <laughs> you can- you Thank can you. <laughs> no, it's all right. <laughs> I, I had a similar experience when I, I did my first book event at Cambridge and <laughs> had a similar experience of the other place. <laughs> yeah, sometimes these rivalries are generative. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I want to just start out, if we can get right into it, and talk about your book, um, Digital Democracy Analog Politics. And I was 
I think before we get into the meat of the book, I was wondering if you could just give us a sense of the overall digital landscape in Kenya, because I think that's something that not everybody mm -hmm. is familiar with. And I'm thinking in particular about the mapping platform, Ushahidi, and the prevalence of mobile money, which I did not, I did not realize that that was the case in Kenya. So can you say a little bit more about yeah. that? Sure. Um, first of all, again, thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here, um, rivalries aside. Um, I think that the easiest way to, to, to get to grips to with the digital in Kenya and how it's affecting public life is to start where my book starts with the 2007-2008 election and the subsequent violence, because that one factor goes a long way in explaining how this one country that isn't the biggest, isn't the wealthiest, doesn't have the most tremendous, you know, natural resource reserves, isn't, you know, it's probably only the fastest, that's probably the only thing that we have, um, but, you know, is is able to to embrace technology and to use it in such creative um, ways, both for good and for bad, and incorporated almost um, um, completely into public life such that today it's difficult to uh, even in rural areas where it, the, the, the impact is more indirect, where people might not appreciate directly how the digital affects them, but really the footprint is, is in every single aspect of our lives. If we're talking about media that is dependent on social media in order to get content, in order to frame their discussions. We're talking about mobile money, especially now with this COVID-19 moment where people are being discouraged from using cash. Um, we're talking about, um, you know, crisis mapping, we're talking about um, the more and more prevalence of um, uh, social networking in people's um, organizing life. And we're talking about government administration, right? So platforms like IFMIS, platforms that are fully integrated into the way in which the government procurement process happens. So even if people cannot maybe So Nanjala is having, has been having a little bit of um, connectivity issues, um, but she usually comes back. So let's give her a minute. Hi. You're back. <laughs> that was very, very strange. Um, but that's what tech will do to you. Um, so um, with that in mind, um, what the 2007 election did is that it accelerated a lot of processes that were already underway. So the internet was first introduced to Kenya in 1993, and the uptake, as it was everywhere, was very slow. It was a luxury item. It was priced as a luxury item. Mobile phones were priced as a luxury item. And the idea that it would one day become such a big part of Kenyan life um, was probably not in the minds of the people who were pushing for um, uh, uh, breaking up, for example, of the telecoms sector, which used to be a government parasitical but was then broken up into smaller private public partnerships and the big mobile phone operator in Kenya is one of those uh, Safaricom is an outgrowth of that breaking up of the old telecoms uh, monopoly um, and the slow uptake was accelerated after the 2002 election which was marked the end of the one party regime and marked the end of the authoritarian regime and the transition the first election in Kenyan history that was won by an opposition party so in that particular uh, period the Minister for ICT, Bitangian Demo, really starts to prioritize uh, connectivity. Not necessarily all of these other superstructures that are built on the back of connectivity, but, you know, connecting the fiber optic cable, um, all of these things that are supposed to give an illusion of modernity and embrace of modernity in the country. Um, but again, I still, the, 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 the internet is still a luxury item. It's still something that rich people in Nairobi do. What the 2007 election does is, first of all, in a rural, a dual system where urban areas are uh, seen almost as transit, transit points where a person will work, you know, for 40 years, 50 years, and then retire and return to a village where people still have extensive familial connections in the rural areas. When the 2007 election violence happened, it was the first time that urban areas were affected. Um, up till that point, except for Mombasa, all of the 
post-election violence had been in rural areas. So it's front and center in, in Nairobi, the capital city, and the city's shut down. So there's no connections between um, the rural and the urban, and people can't go back home. People can't retreat to their villages, and people can't send money. People can't, you know, you have a whole family that's dependent on you, and there's nothing you can do. What that does is that it makes this technology, this mobile money technology that was launched in 2006, it just accelerates its embrace, it accelerates its popularity. At the same time, um, with crisis mapping with Ushahidi and all of these platforms, it's, it's on, a ma on a much larger scale because you have this massive diaspora, you have significant numbers of Kenyans who are living in the UK, US, Russia, Turkey, wherever you can sort of throw your stone. And they're trying to keep in touch with what's happening in the country and following what's happening in the country, but the traditional media has not yet embraced technology, does not yet have websites. So the digital becomes a place where people can get that information about what's happening with the political process in the country, with the, with the violence, with the subsequent peace settlements. And finally, as an outgrowth of that is the accountability piece, because, you know, the corruption and the lack of transparency in government, and especially in the electoral process, was identified as the core reason why the violence happened in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so the digital is embedded in the peace settlement in Kenya. We have the the four commissions that came from that agreement between the two um, uh, uh, belligerents, the two fighting uh, parties, the two, we call them principles. And one of those commissions is called the Independent Review Commission or the Kriegler Commission. And the Kriegler Commission basically says that one way of addressing the transparency gap with elections in Kenya is to add computers, is to use computers to administer the electoral process. And in the end, that would begin this 10 year process of digitizing elections in Kenya that culminated in the 2017 election, which was the first fully digital election in Kenya, the second in Africa after Namibia. But it was also um, the outgrowths of that in other domains where, because the digital was held up as this panacea with regards to the election, that sort of attitude starts to affect other spaces of governance. So IFMIS in public procurement and contract management, um, you have the Huduma number right now with the digital identity system. The whole idea, the, the whole um, ethos of the state being that if we throw computers at some of these transparency issues that we have, we might be able to resolve them. And so that's where Kenya is right now, it's that um, ICT, um, tech more broadly, is seen as a way of resolving age-old questions about governance and the relationship between the citizen and the state and the relationship, especially around elections, how to resolve what have always been, you know, we talk about the post um, Kanu era 1992, but really con elections in Kenya have been fraught since 1952, 1957, sorry. And um, trying to use the digital as a substitute for a lot of more um, normative things like trust and transparency and uh, community. And there's good and there's bad and, and there's things that are still up in the air. Um, the good, you know, are seeing people in the few uh, Kenyans publicly, you know, uh, not only declaring their identity and declaring their affiliations, but, um, you know, being members of organizations and that are at the forefront of public litigation, public interest litigation, pushing for, um, you know, a more human rights oriented um, uh, judicial process. Um, the idea of coalitions between, you know, people who are fighting for environmental rights in Lamu and people who are fighting to repeal anti-gay laws um, in Nairobi and people who are fighting for, you know, against the dams in Ethiopia and the impact on Lake Trukana, all of these coalitions would not have been possible without the digital. And, you know, we see the rise of, of radical feminism and very public radical feminism that is rejecting the paradigm of a woman as a mother being the totem, the ultimate political totem, that a woman who is not a mother um, cannot aspire to public life, cannot aspire to having a public profile. The internet is making it possible for women to challenge that particular structure. Um, but there is bad. All the things that we worry about over, all over the world, doxing, um, harassment, new types of new types of um, 
talking about surveillance, prior capacity to understand or to deal with. And then you know the worst part of it, the things that are, are going to be a problem in Kenya, going to be a problem in the US, are a problem in, in the UK, are a problem everywhere. The influence of private capital on democratic processes of money, on how our public lives are organized. Um, should, what does it mean when key political debates are happening on private platforms that are owned by American shareholders who are only answerable to uh, American companies that are answerable to American shareholders that are answerable to an American legislator. What does that mean, you know, when Twitter, Facebook, and all these social networking platforms become so embedded in the way in which we think about public participation and public discourse? Because um, it's very different for an American Twitter user to, to have a relation, uh, that particular interaction with Twitter than it is for a Kenyan user, because what can I do um, when Twitter isn't even recognized as a legal entity if I ask for redress, if I'm a victim of doxing or a victim of whatever practices is done online. So that's just the broad lay of the land. It's, it's you know, a little bit of, of the big question that I always uh, sort of, I'm stuck on and I want people to really think about is, how do we incubate the good, right. um, really honestly confront the challenges? And that's the question that we're grappling with in Kenya today as people everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, just as an aside, as you were speaking, I was seeing a lot of parallels to the way we treat technology and education, which is something I'm really sensitive to now that all the education is online. And some, if we just get the technology right, the education will be fine, you know, and, um, and not really interrogating um, who's making these platforms, for what purposes, what sorts of pedagogies are being transmitted. And um, anyway, that's, mm -hmm. that's speaking from my mm -hmm. particular uh, <laughs> schooling, several children at the moment, um, thinking about those questions on a smaller scale. Um, but I, so I think you did, you, within that discussion, you really captured a lot of the themes and sort of messages of the book. Um, particularly in thinking about technology, like you said, as not neutral, right? It has possibilities, but it also has constraints. There's a lot of forces trying to capture it for various purposes. Mm -hmm. And, and that um, digital technology is an enterprise. You know, you really, mm -hmm. emphasize, you keep that as a through line as well. Um, mm -hmm. But I was wondering, you know, if, if someone on an elevator <laughs> sees you and asks what your book is about, and particularly thinking about this sort of, tension between digital democracy, analog politics, like what do you mean there? What are you trying to say with that? Um, what I'm trying to do is to recenter societies and individual individuals in the conversations around technology use around the world and technology in relation to politics. Because I think for the longest time we were so focused on the structural that if we built the tech, you know everything is going to be fine and we took the normative out of the conversation and more importantly we took the people out of the conversation many of these technologies are built in abstraction they're built by people who maybe don't spend you know three years thinking about political theory and don't spend you know four years five years thinking about uh, um, normative ethics and philosophy and all of these things and and less so even you know how is this going to play out in this African country that is not, you know, South Africa or Egypt or whatever. And what we've seen in the last 10 years, I would say, especially since the Arab Spring, but in many ways before that, is the failure to think about individuals and societies and the way we uh, build and, and um, uh, deploy technology is creating a problem or is, is compounding existing problems and creating new problems that the people who have the most power in this new reality don't understand and don't know what to do about. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring people and societies back into this conversation. And I wrote about Kenya specifically, not because I'm from Kenya, not because you know um, that's what I you know live with, but because again, the conversation has been so centered in the American experience that even the, the conversation on tech and politics was so centered on the U.S. experience that even the U.S. was lost <laughs> because the, it, was, it became a Silicon Valley conversation. It became maybe Silicon Valley and you know, some uh, block in Manhattan. And, and what we want to do is to stop 
abdicating the moral questions and the trickier questions about society and individuals and and public life and social contracts and all of these things and to see in places where power isn't necessarily organized in the way in which the textbooks say that it should be what does this technology actually do and and how does it actually uh, work so that's really what i'm trying to do yeah yeah that's great. I mean, I think you do it. <laughs> and I think it's, it's com like you, you chart a complicated, you know, path, like the part of, I, I appreciated the complexity that it's not just a binarist tension, you know, between mm -hmm. the state and, and society or something like that. But there's a lot of actors um, with a lot of interests, right? Uh, um, and, and also a lot of cap a lot of capability and a lot of, um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and capability that they don't know, a lot of them don't even know that they have. I mean, I go to a lot of meetings with tech people um, and what I always get from these conversations is that a lot of times they don't even know that they have the capacity to affect political processes the way that they do. So a great example is this report. There's a report that just came out from Vice yesterday, which was about hate speech in Ethiopia. But those of us who have been working on these issues raised the flag on Ethiopia last year, year before last, because what has happened is in the absence of a robust uh, local, like the internet, if your telecom is a monopoly, it's run by the state, it's slow, it's inefficient, it's you know, riddled with all of the issues that you would expect from a giant um, a monopoly that has very little accountability you know, in an authoritarian context. And with the, what has happened for a lot of people is that Facebook became the primary way through which they were able to connect to the internet. And a lot of opposition media, opposition, um, uh, uh, at the time, this is before the the the, the ha, ter, I don't know even how to call it. Is it a revolution? Is it a changeover? Let's call it a, before the changeover um, in two thousand and and uh, accounts to get of last year, one of these outlets. Well, first, before that, we people lost, had been... We lost you for mm. just a second. So you were saying um, before the revolution or during the revolution, the changeover. Yeah, let's call it a changeover. Okay. Um, the, red, the, the analysts were raising the flag that underneath the veneer of this... ...was a high fragmented stations about conquest and real as the temperatures rose too high that particular um warning if you will wasn't really very well heated and so for example in october of last year there was one of these facebook outlets um put up a post uh, on like a friday i think it was and over the next 48 hours uh 68 people died as they're out of the room resulting um, ethnic clashes. And the story is, there's obviously a lot of contention, but what seems to have happened is that the particular Facebook post um, was seen as an invitation to violence, was seen as an invitation to preemptively, quote unquote, defend against an attack that didn't materialize, wasn't going to materialize because it wasn't, it was something that seemed probable, but wasn't actually going to happen. And the situation in Ethiopia has escalated considerably since October last year. This is 12 months later. And um, the underlying questions about what is the role of an American social networking site in a company in a country like Ethiopia have never been addressed. What has remained is this idea that Ethiopia is a frontier economy. You know, it's um, the second largest country per population in sub-Saharan Africa. It has this market that has is just latent with all this energy that we had in Kenya in 2007 because the, the story is that they're going to break up Ethio Telecom and there's going to be room there for, for money to be made. And the political questions, the more complex public uh, questions are just getting swept under the rug. And so you talk to the tech people and you ask them, well, do you know what's happening in Ethiopia? And they'll tell you all about, you know, privatization of Ethio Telecom and blah, blah, blah. And you're like, but do you know what's happening in Ethiopian villages? 
Do you know what's happening in places where people are only getting their information from these groups that are being run on your website for good or for bad, right? Because there is good. There is definitely good that's happening, but they, there is not as much of an understanding of those issues as you would want. And that has everything to do with the meta question about how tech makes it possible for corporations to exert a disproportionate amount of influence, not just, I mean, we, the people have been studying MNCs and, and, and you know, um, what is the neoliberalism and, and all of that for a long time. But this is, I guess, the new face of that, that what, it, what, what tech makes possible is for corporations to insinuate themselves so completely in public discourse. And I think that raises certain obligations to the tech companies and the people who build the platforms. And I'm not sure that the people who are doing that fully understand what it is that they're doing and how it's going to affect the way in which society is organized. So that's just an example, I think, of why it's important to look at how these things are happening in the other side of the world. Because until 2016, a lot of these people who are building these platforms took the structures of democracy and society for granted because they were living in societies where they thought these things were inviolate. And by the time we are here today, where we're seeing that's actually not the case, we who are in Kenya could have said, well, we've been through this. <laughs> could have told, I could have warned you. <laughs> um, so we have to get better at listening across difference, I think. Right, yeah. I, absolutely. And I think to, I mean, this context is one in which connections, right, rather than separation, is 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 what's salient. We're seeing these connect these transnational connections and circulations. Um, so, my colleague David Simon has a question here, and it and I think it gets at what you were just talking about in the Ethiopian case. Can you see the questions? If you okay, so I'm going to read it to you. I can. <laughs> says, well, I'll read it just in case. He says, thank you for this work. I'm wondering if you could comment on the ways in which social media sets in motion or facilitates political or perhaps um, ethnic or national identity based polarization. Do you see social media as having potential to slow polarization down? And I think you talk about this a little bit in your book and I've heard you speak about this mm. kind of how how media in general in Kenya has become more ethnicized, if you will, um, and how social media has both pushed back at that and also reinforced it, maybe. Reinforced it. And, I, and that is the paradox. Um, you know, when I keep going back to how do we incubate the good and how do we stop the bad, I think the ethnic polarization question is a great example of this. What the, what, is at the heart of the polarization question is the way in which algorithms, the algorithms that determine what information you receive, um, you know, who you hear when you're online, um, those are the things that are making these decisions. And the people who build the algorithms argue that they're neutral and argue that they reflect, um, you know, machines sort of picking up on the cues that we put up there and, and responding to those cues or mimicking um, those cues. But the people, you know, the people, there are many, much, you know, much smarter people who have studied algorithms uh, to much greater detail than I have ever have. But the general consensus seems to be that um, the algorithms are so accustomed, are so, the way that they're built are so attuned to picking up extremes that, and they're not good at nuance. And they're not good at all of the soft things that we have in our human interactions that sort of um, moderate you know, um, extreme behavior. And so in the public sphere, for example, you know, if I walked up to a person, a physical, physical public space, and I walked up to a person and started yelling invectives at them and, you know, calling them an idiot and a racist of them, I'd probably get beaten down. I probably, <laughs> there would probably be some pushback. Um, and because I know that there will be consequences, I as an individual will moderate my own behavior in ways that are difficult to express. I'll just know, you know what, I'm not trying to get beaten up. Um, at 11 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday. Um, those are not things that you can really code for. What you can code for is for the things that push people to such an extreme that they begin to act publicly. So what is it that would make me sit on my computer and actually type out a Facebook post? It's not likely to be something small. It's not likely to be something moderate. It's likely to be something extreme. And so the algorithms are getting trained on our most extreme, the most extreme versions of ourselves. 
And as a result, we're being fed on a diet of the most extreme versions of ourselves in terms of what content gets prioritized, what content you get, you get um, um, served with. And so in the book, what I, what I argue, what I put forward as a hypothesis is ethnic language, eth ethnicity in Kenya is so heavily coded by your first name, your last name, you know, where you went to school, what football team you support, blah, blah, blah. and because these platforms are not built with Kenya in mind, it is difficult for them to pick out, you know, this person is this ethnic group and this person is the other. It's difficult to code for that. And I think that's the only thing that really spared Kenya some of the extreme outcomes that we're seeing in other places where it's much easier to code for this person's name is Patel and therefore this person is Hindu. This person's name is, you know, Asim and then therefore this person is Muslim. And, um, you know, in other cases, that's, that's not happening where it is able to code for this extreme language, extreme um, uh, whatever, where it's able to pick up the divisions that uh, within the society, then you have this heightened polarization in the public discourse. And on top of that, you have people who are building software, using the API to build things that exacerbate that for political gain. And this is what happened with the Nigeria election in 2015. Not only was this low, this uh, already pre-existing polarization along religious lines, and religion is very easy to code for. You know, it's very easy to know that this person named Mustafa is a Muslim and this person named Christopher is probably a Christian. Um, and, and picked up on that. And then you had on this top layer, this British consulting firm building software, uh, building, you know, uh, news, uh, what do you call it? Like using the API in order to target information to specific people in order to heighten that polarization. So can, how can social media um, You know, I think to get rid of, or to, yeah, I, you know, to get rid of the the um, the more extreme versions of these algorithms, you know, because I, again, I'm not a techie and I don't necessarily know the specifics of how this would work. But I remember what I was one of those people who was on Facebook when it was still just college students who could be on it, and you had to have a university address to be on it. And I remember the, you know, the big problem then was that you were getting too much information. It was like, so-and-so had a sand avocado sandwich for breakfast. Okay, I don't care. I don't need this. And so the algorithms were supposed to help us um, get only the information that we need so that we could spend, because people, when people had too much information, they stopped spending time on the website. They were like, it's too much information. I'm wasting too much time. I got to get off Facebook. So the algorithms are designed to get us to spend more time on the, on the website by only interacting with information that responds to our biases, our predispositions and all of you. Is there a world in which a social networking site says, we actually don't care about the advertising revenue. We actually don't care about, you know, we actually just want you to have productive political conversations with, does that mean that we need social networking sites that are public utilities? That's another question that's been floating around in a lot of these conferences. Does that mean that we build a social networking site that's funded by taxes? You know, these are some of the, the, the broader questions that I think um, people are starting to grapple with that would sort of answer that question. That, you know, I, I like to emphasize that this is social, media, especially social media, but tech, but social media, especially, this is social media version 4.0. So there is no reason to believe that there can't be a 5.0 that corrects for all of these issues, you know, just like Twitter and Facebook corrected for all of the issues that we had with Friendster and uh, what was that other one? Um, Oh gosh, I'm blanking. But you know, AOL, you bought the, the MySpace. That's the one. <laughs> MySpace. There is no reason to believe that there can't be a 5.0 that does all of this stuff better. But in order to get there, people have to understand the problems that are happening now. And I think where we are right now, unfortunately, is not at resolution. It is at, whoa, we need to understand what's actually happening. Yeah. Yeah. That's, Yeah. <laughs> I hear you. Um, uh, I have more to say to that, but I'm going to move to the other question. 
<laughs> we have questions, um, several questions here, but I do invite you, if you would like um, to, to write a question, please do that. I am looking at them right now. Um, so, uh, Hawa, I will come to you in a second, but I want to go to anonymous attendee um, who says, Hi, Nanjala, I'm really happy to read your work. Do you think we are really making headway in Kenya in the gender discourse and patriarchy patriarchy dismantling in Kenya, Oof. even in the politics arena? And I think there's a, there's a question of gender in politics here in this question, but then also what you address in your book is the way that social media has been mobilized by women to press for particular yeah. change and also to give them space to be who they want to be um, yeah. without repercussions. Yeah. I think one of the main reasons why the book has a tenure arc as opposed to this is where Kenya is right now, is precisely to keep perspective. I think when you're in the throes of a struggle and when you're in the throes of a social issue, it's very difficult to believe that progress is being made because you're always seeing all of the work that still needs to be done. And there's definitely a lot of work that remains to be done with regards to gender issues and regards to women's participation in politics in Kenya. Like there's so much stuff that still needs to be done. But at the same time, I think about what where we were um, 10 years, 20 years, 22 years ago. And I do see um, a significant amount of change. And a lot of that change is coming from women being able to, or people who identify as women being able to publicly own their identities and to be um, uh, in opposition to the dominant narrative and to claim space to articulate a different way of, of being feminine in Kenya. Um, I'm old enough to remember, you know, the tail end of the Mandalawi and Wanawake um, dominance where, you know, you had to be, Wangari Madai, Nobel Prize winner, first African woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize, was chastised roundly by the formal women's rights movement, the Mandalawi and Wanawake movement, because she was divorced. Mm. And, you know, is completely it would be absurd even to the ordinary Kenyan because there's been a lot of transformation in the public discourse about the role of women and the place for women so there's been some gains now with regards to politics I mean that's a separate uh, question I don't think that the status of status of women in po electoral politics in Kenya reflects the status of women in society as accurately as it could I think that politics because it has become this all-consuming point of, you know, if you want to have a successful business, become a politician. If you want to have a successful, um, uh, you know, anything, become a politician. If you, it's, it's, everything is so oriented around it that the stakes are incredibly high. And so the patriarchy is really invested in protecting its position within electoral politics. You will have Kenyan women in boards. They are, I believe, as of the last statistics, there were more Kenyan women registered at university than men. Um, different statistics about graduation. Um, most of the small, medium enterprises uh, in the country are owned by women. We're talking about the women who sell vegetables. You're talking about, you know, um, so it's not, what's happening with the electoral space is not necessarily fully reflective of the gains and the losses that women have made in other aspects of public life. That does not negate some of the big overarching issues. Um, and the one that I keep coming back to is the example of domestic violence, which remains to me, to my mind, my assessment, it's the most pervasive form of violence in the country. Um, according to the Demographic and Health Survey, if, uh, the last Demographic and Health Survey, 40% 49% of all women over 40 in Kenya across ethnic lines, every single region in the country have been a victim of domestic violence. It's the only type of violence that does not discriminate on class, does not discriminate on uh, geographical location or ethnicity, etc. And so all of, all of which is to say that I think with perspective you kind of start to if you take a 30-year arc as opposed to a five-year you know from this election to this other election arc you see that there really has been some movement but absolutely it's not we're not done there's still a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done right yeah 
Thank you for that. I think you, in, in your book too, you, you know, present just three stories of women whose experiences of violence, um, uh, drove a lot of online activism, but with very different mm -hmm. real world, um, outcomes, restitution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, mm -hmm. that's a perfect example. Um, so this is from Hawa and, um, they say, my name is Hawa. Bali. I work in the field of peace building projects management and have recently been more and more thinking about how we encourage inclusive participation participation in designing tools for IDPs, mm -hmm. internally displaced people, or for conflict management. Wow. So, yeah. So, how do we encourage inclusive participa participation in the designing of the tools that benefit IDPs? I can say, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I really don't. I think um, the only thing I can say to that question is that we have to get better at listening to people who don't have power in the way in which we've constructed our public lives. And I think displaced persons are some of the people who, um, we are collectively um, not great at listening to. Um, there are so many examples, even if you just go on the news today, whether you're talking about you know, the Mediterranean Sea, you're talking about the, the US, you're talking about um, um, Syria, you're talking about Somalis and Kenya. There are so many examples of today of how we're just not good at listening to people. Something about the way in which displacement has been used to project this dehumanization and so that means these people are not worth listening to we save them but we don't listen to them you know paradigm so i think that's all i can say to that question i think that the best starting point is to start getting better at listening to what the demands are and what people ca can bring to the table right sorry yeah. i wish that a better answer <laughs> Well, I would, I would just add to that, that that is so important. I'm thinking in particular about the way that IDPs and people in formal refugee camps more and more mm -hmm. that are managed, especially the ones that are managed by a group of mm -hmm. NGOs, um, transparency, accountability, those things are, are really hard to uh, access yeah. in those spaces. And so it seems like part of the tools that helped make um, made structures of power over those or regulatory structures more accountable and transparent and grievance processes um, more transparent yeah. would would be maybe one one of those ways. Yeah, actually, and and just to build off of what you just said, um, when it comes to digital action in public life. Um, there is a researcher, British researcher, Karen Weitzberg, who is working on this issue and, and Corey Rogers also at Oxford. Um, what a lot of people don't realize, we've, we've had this huge opposition to the digital ID project in Kenya, which was launched um, last year. And there are all these questions about privacy and dignity and all of that stuff. But when you start to do the digging and, and these researchers have done the digging, there is a precedent with regards to that widespread data collection and using digital ID um, for entitlements to decide who can get an entitlement, who can get food and who doesn't get food. And the precedent isn't with refugee populations. It is in Kakuma refugee camp. It is the Darab refugee camp. And you know, UNHCR are running this massive data collection and um, um, you know, entitlements, uh, digital entitlement system that has had severe um, you know, impact on the dignity and life of uh, refugees, but didn't get any public attention because even in Kenya, because people don't really see the lives of refugees. They don't really see them as human beings. It's just, it's an afterthought. And now that we're having these broader conversations about digital ID and data and privacy, and, and, and there's this like, you know, scrambling to find precedents, to find, you know, all of these histories. It's like, oh my gosh, here's this massive system that's been operating in the country that is being operated by a foreign entity in the country. Um, and we don't really understand how it works and, and how it's affecting people's lives. So, you know, it just goes back to that point that you're making about um, listening better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To people who don't have power. Right. Um, well, I think you talking in particular about sort of this data harvesting, this um, 
wild west of, <laughs> you know, for, or free market of, of, of data harvesting that's happening right now. Um, Mina has a question and she says, she, she, I think says, ahead of transnational elections in Kenya, what safeguards can be developed and used against weaponization of social media in the way that Cambridge Analytica did in 2017, 2018, and others are planning to do, <laughs> even as we speak? Yeah. You can, you can also- um, That is a that, fantastic can also question. also solve, solve that question for us, um, for the US, because we have an election coming up to you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say. <laughs> oh. I need to get the, the DOJ to, to, to contract me so I can un, un, <laughs> unravel this mystery. I think there's two levels to this question. One is the meta level, the sort of philosophical um, plane. And then the other is the practical level, um, but in terms of practical actionable steps. At the philosophical level, what we need is for people to go back to the fundamentals of governance and government and what is governance and government for? What are elections for? Um, what kind of representation do we want our, our elections to generate, um, our public processes to generate? And I think that's been lost in a lot of societies around the world over the last um, 10, 15 years. I think people have become so accustomed to the idea of elections for elections sake and that the, the, the access to power and having power without any um, um, subsequent consequences or responsibility has become the norm in far more countries than you know, those who are, are still thinking about um, um, governance in the more idealistic uh, normative ways. And so I think one of the things that I, I keep telling, trying to remind people is, let's just go back to the fundamentals of why we build societies in the first place and look, at, contrast that with how in the, the point of elections has been translated and start to dismantle this paradigm that if we just have enough elections, democracy is gonna be great. Democracy is not just about elections, it's about public participation and governance. So what does that look like on a day-to-day -day level away from contestation? Elections are not, it's not the Colosseum. We're not throwing people, you know, to the lions to have them fight it out and then the winner sort of gets, you know, laurel or whatever. No, it, it has to be much more fundamental than that. And that's at the philosophical level. At the practical level, I think first, the social networking sites internally need to dedicate more resources to understanding the political and social dimensions of the platforms that they built. And that means investing in research, that means investing in personnel, that means investing in, you know, building uh, criticisms, people who will tell you the truth about what it is that you're doing in unqualified terms to make sure that you don't uh, compound the challenges that you've brought. And some of that might involve saying, maybe we need to let this thing go. Maybe this platform needs to not exist because it's beyond redemption. That needs to be on the table. The economic survival of one company and its shareholders cannot take precedence over the survival of an entire society or of an entire way of life. Um, in, in practical terms, that also means that we need to, I don't want to use this phrase digital literacy because I think it flattens a lot of really complicated conversations. But certainly what we need to do is to have more members of the public who understand what is actually happening? What does manipulation actually look like? Why does it, and in a non-sensationalist way. Now, I think this is where American media especially keeps dropping the ball is that everybody's trying to outscoop each other and everything's getting really sensationalist, but the other people are like, I don't understand what this means. And I don't understand what I can do about it. So how do we take these conversations and present them in a non-sensationalist way so that people can actually understand manipulation, what these tech firms are doing. And that's one of the things I try to do with my book. You know, it, it's published in an academic press, it's published in and things like that. But the language was deliberately accessible and it was deliberately conversational because I wanted people to understand what was happening. I didn't want to just talk to people within the academy. I wanted to have to start a conversation that could be had by anybody who you know had 30 minutes to an hour to start to start to to grasp at the issues how do we make that the norm i think is something that we as people who are at universities who have the privilege of 
um, well, I'm not at university, but people who are at universities, people who are in research institutes who have the privilege of time and resources and uh, um, can start to really see this as a public responsibility. I'm not just here to make you freak out and, and, and you know, you know, start to tremble in fear. I really want you to understand what's happening so that you can make the demands yourself for what kind of uh, governance, public space, public sphere you want to, to operate within. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I think we don't talk or think enough about the pedagogical um, aspects of the media or the pedagogical mandate of the media. Mm -hmm. Media has a role to play in that as well. And um, it's definitely something that, yeah, that we need in this moment. So we just have a few minutes left. Um, and I think Sarah and Jennifer were both sort of echoing, thinking about how these things work with, um, you know, how, how social media um, can help resolve social crises. So Sarah brings up gender-based mm -hmm. violence, which we talked about a little bit, but other kinds of social crises. And then Jennifer, who is from Columbia, was also, um, you know, thinking about uh, like whether, this is actually something that you, you talk about in your book, and we just have a couple minutes so we can bring it up. Her question is kind of related around how the government of Kenya has maybe co-opted the algorithms of Facebook or the data from there. And, and, and I think you talk about how the government has really been excited about the digital sphere as a space for surveillance, but not really a space for service or service mm -hmm. vision. And so maybe, you, and, and, and maybe that's relevant to our moment with COVID as well. Like maybe you want to kind of reflect on, yeah. on what's happening right now. I think, I think if I'm going to take that quote and, and I'm going to plaster it somewhere because I think that actually captures it. Um, what I, I will say very quickly um, is that number one, we must never forget that power learns and power adapts. And the whole idea of marginalized uh, or, or preferably unheard communities turning the social networks, turning the internet into a place where they could get heard worked as long as power did not see the digital as a space where it could extend itself. That has changed a lot. The, the, the internet that made Tunisia's Arab Spring moment possible was not the internet that Egypt encountered. It was not the e internet that Syria encountered. And that was only in like a two year, three year arc. So people have to appreciate that whatever uh, governments are learning, power is adapting. And so we can't always work on the presumption that they're, they don't understand, and they're never going to understand what's happening, and everybody's, that the same contours of marginalization and exclusion that we see in the offline are not going to eventually replicate themselves on the online, unless there's a deliberate in, uh, effort to keep and preserve, you know, dignity of minorities, the dignity of uh, women, the dignity of people who have relatively less power on these online spaces, it's just going to replicate whatever we're seeing offline. Um, and the, the second part of that is, you know, the, the question of the Kenyan government. Um, I think that this is, a, again, uh, you know, the thing that you said about um, the media as, as a public accountability tool. When people ask me why, how we can address uh, misinformation, I always go back to this. Well, why is it? that people are tr getting their information from the internet and not from a newspaper and not from the radio and not from the television when these outlets pre-exist pre them and have much wider reach. You know, the most, most watched television network in Kenya is in 78% of all homes in the country. The internet is, you know, Twitter is one, there are only a million accounts in the population of 47, 48 million. So why is it that people are more dependent on this? And it is as a result of things that are happening on the offline space. It is a result of the relationship between the media and power. And that's why I spend, you know, two chapters th talking about the media in Kenya and talking about these connections with power, because that abdication of that responsibility to inform and the responsibility to keep the government's feet to the fire is why people prefer to get their political news on the internet, is why people are more likely to believe WhatsApps and, and forwards and things like that than they are to believe the front page of the Daily Nation. So these are some of the complexities that I think, you know, to loop it all back to the beginning is 
why it's important. You can't understand how the internet is going to affect a society if you don't understand that society in the first place. And so if there was any practical thing that we need to all be figuring out how to do, whether you're in the social networking firms, whether you're a researcher or whatever, is to better understand different societies in this digital moment and not just have people who can build an incredibly technically sound platform that makes discrimination worse, that makes violence worse, that makes polarization worse. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's see what happens <laughs> in the next few months. We've got our work cut out for us right now. Um, Nanjala, I'm Absolutely. so grateful for you taking the time to talk with us. It has been an honor to meet you virtually and to have this conversation. <laughs> and um, yeah, I wish you all the best. Thank you to everyone who attended. And again, to Thank you. Nora for all of their work on the back end as well. Take care and thank you. Thank you. you. Uh, stay tuned for, you know, anyone that's interested, stay tuned. There will be more Yale Council on African Studies discussions happening over this year. So, all right. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.